grade 12s, it is your time for physical sciences. I am Looney and joining me in studio today is Phil. Phil, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks. And Looney, Looney? I'm good, thank you. So what are we doing? Well, today we're going to be taking a look at standard electrode potentials. We're going to be elaborating on last week's, ex last week's experiments. We're going to be taking a look at a little bit of redox, oxidation reduction, doing a little bit of navigating on that complicated table. Mm, okay, great. Charles, you heard it, doing that table. I can remember that. Ah, I remember just clearly, guys, it was just yesterday that I did all of this. But I hope you guys do enjoy the show. Remember to keep in touch with us on Facebook. You can go on to facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Our Twitter handle is at learn extra. You can download all the show notes, the videos, the schedules, past exam papers to prepare you guys for the upcoming exams on learn extra.co.za forward slash live remember guys we are having saturday school this weekend i will be presenting join me this weekend guys from nine to half past one i will be presenting saturday school so we'll be going ev going through everything that you need to know great tells and all the subjects that you are worried about and i will be there helping you with everything that you need to know so with all that said full i think we should get started thank you so much okay well as i said standard electrode potentials some very fancy sounding words, but it's actually quite a simple concept if you get down to the nitty gritty of the redox. Now guys, before we go any further, please, I need you with a pencil in your hand and a redox table. Now if you're looking through some of the past papers, get on the web, get those notes, because included into the notes, I've linked up links to some of the past papers. And in those past papers, you will find exactly the table that I'm talking about. Now, the table you're looking for is called Table 4B. It's at the back of the exams. Now, they're on the web. They're at the back of your textbooks. Get one ready while we start with this. Before we jump onto that table, before we get all excited about electrode potentials and E-naught cell potentials and potential differences and EMFs and all those fancy words, what we're going to do is we're going to map out what's happening today. We're going to start out fairly simple. We're going to start by familiarizing ourselves with the table of standard electrode potentials. So this is the table that I'm looking for, and this is the one that I want in front of you. There we go. The table of standard electrode potentials. Now I'm going to explain some of the words that come in here. So there we go. There's uh, the table that we're looking for, table 4B again. All right, standard of table, um, sorry, standard electrode potentials before I get all tongue twisted and excited about this. Okay, now we're going to see how it works and the way that we're going to do all of our experiments today is we're going to start by saying where is it on the standard um, potentials table and how can we figure out what half reactions are happening and how much voltage is going to be produced. So now, first we need to start out where those voltages actually come from and I'm going to introduce you to something called the Stan hydrogen electrode. Then after all of that's done, we're going to get into the exam style questions. We're going to use the table to find out the combined cell potentials of two half reactions. Now this is where people get a little bit confused, like two half reactions, why are you splitting things in half and why are you putting them together as one cell and how can I deal with all of this? Guys, slow it down, break it down with us and we're going to show you how to get to these examination questions. Now if you're looking for the examination question that we're going to be dealing with at the end of the show, it's question 10 from the 2010 March paper. Okay, so again, that's question 10 from the 2010 March paper. And Matrix, please, when you're taking a look at these shows, we're always going to be tackling some of those exam questions. Have the exams with you. Get them on your phone, your tablet, your computer, whatever, or print them out, or get them from your teacher at school, but have these papers, because we're always tackling something relevant there. And the best way to get familiar and to reduce that anxiety is, of course, to go through these exam-style questions. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump straight into it. Now, here is the table that scares a lot of my tricks, but it really shouldn't. Guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to walk you through the structure of this table, how to use it, what it all means, why there's voltages all over the place and arrows pointing up and down. So let's take a slow look at what this thing actually is. Now, it says the standard electrode potential. Now, first of all, let's deal with these words. What does standard actually mean? Now, standard means that all of these things were collected under familiar or at least the same conditions. Now, for anyone that's taking a look at what standard conditions are, and this is inside those brilliant show notes that are available on the web from our website. Here we go. Standard. Now, there's certain standard conditions under which this table was manufactured. Now, you can see table 4B. It's got all these standard reduction potentials. And those standard conditions are... For a solution, it's 25 degrees Celsius. And for those of you that have just done gas laws or revised all of this, this is 298 Kelvin. Now, that is a standard temperature. Now, it's standard temperature 
pressure and concentration for here. So here we go. Here's my standard temperature. My standard concentration is one mole per decimeter cubed. Now, if you're watching very closely in the grade 11 show, they're revising the meaning of concentration. So there we go. There's my standard concentration. Now, that sorts out most of the table. But some of these electrodes contain gases. So I need standard of one atmosphere. Now, atmospheres are not an SI unit. What is an SI unit? is pascals. So we can say that it, that is 101.3 kilopascals, or if you want to be more correct, it's 101.3 times 10 to the 3 pascals. But we're not going to get too tied up in that. Just say that there is a standard temperature, pressure, and concentration. Sorry, um, sorry. Temperature, pressure, and concentration that you need to take into account when you're making up one of these tables. Now let's take a little bit of a closer look at what this table actually says. Now, you might have said, okay, well, this is called the redox table. But I don't know how many of you have actually read the title up at the top there. Now, I know this text is way too small to read, but I'm hoping that you've got one in front of you at home there. There's some words up at the top here. It says standard reduction potentials. I want you to think about this for a second. Standard reduction potential. Now, this word reduction, if you've been watching for the last few weeks, reduction is the gain of electrons. And now potential is something which might happen. So this is telling me there's a whole bunch of things which might happen, and this is telling me how likely it is that that will happen. Now these numbers on the right-hand side here are quite important because they actually give me an order for these to go in. So now I've got an order of reduction potentials. This number tells me how likely it is that reduction will happen to this particular chemical. So, for instance, for some of the ones up at the top, you'll notice that their voltages are very negative. And I've actually circled them and I've highlighted them and made them really nice and large here. So I can see negative 3.05. Negative means not very likely. Less than zero, in fact. So that tells me that lithium is very unlikely to undergo reduction. Now, Matrix, you might say, okay, well, how does this help me get marks? Guys, let's focus on the process rather than the outcome. What I'm telling you is that lithium is much more likely to undergo oxidation, instead lose its electrons rather than gain electrons. Now that number over there tells me all of this information. And if you start taking a closer look, I start to notice some interesting patterns. I start to notice that the ones up at the top really don't want to undergo reduction, but the ones down at the bottom have got these nice big positive values. In fact, I'm going to blow that up for a second. The one right down at the bottom, which is F2, fluorine, has got a very strong reduction potential. That means that fluorine really would like to undergo reduction. Fluorine wants to gain electrons. Now, if you remember from grade 10 chemistry, this all makes sense because fluorine is highly electronegative. Fluorine likes electrons so much and likes gaining them a lot. So fluorine is very likely to undergo reduction. In fact, it's got the most likelihood of undergoing reduction and its voltage there, or potential rather, before we get into voltage and confuse things, it tells me that its potential to undergo reduction is the greatest on the table. So fluorine is the best at undergoing reduction. Okay, so we've got this highest to lowest rank order of all these voltages. The question is, where do these voltages actually come from? Now, that's a little bit confusing until you start taking a look right in the middle. There's something right in the middle, which I'm a particular fan of, because this particular reaction is the thing which gives sour food some taste, and that is the half reaction involving H plus and H2. Now, H plus and H2, some very clever scientists realized that this was a reaction which was somewhere in the middle of all of these reduction potentials, and said, why don't we make that the standard? So, very unimaginatively and very unconfusing-like, they said this should be the standard hydrogen electrode. So the standard hydrogen electrode, they said, well, let's make that zero volts. So compared to everything else, this will be the standard against which we measure everything else. So 0, 0.00 volts, that's not measured against anything but itself, but it's saying that that is the level playing ground. That's the bar against which we're going to me measure other things. If other things are negative, that means that this one would rather go under, um, undergo reduction. Now, the question is, how do we actually set this all up? This just looks like numbers and symbols on a page to me. Where do all these numbers come from? 
Well, let's take a look. Okay, so here we go. Here's how to use the standard hydrogen electrode. Sometimes it's abbreviated, abbreviated the SHE, and here's why. Standard hydrogen electrode, the standard hydrogen electrode. That is zero volts. That's where everything is measured from. So that is the place where we measure 0, 0.0 volts. Now, let's see how we actually use it. We use it to compare with other unknown mixtures. So if we want to fi figure out does zinc want to undergo reduction or oxidation, we don't actually know. All you've got to do is connect it up in a cell with the standard hydrogen electrode. And let me show you what that means. So the picture on your screen at the moment is comparing two reactions. So on the left-hand side, I have the standard hydrogen electrode. Try and see if you can spot some of the things and some of the reasons I call this a standard hydrogen electrode. Well, first of all, some of the things that I told you earlier on in the show might be showing up, and I hope that you recognize them. I've got H2 as a gas at one atmosphere, or 101.3 kilopascals. So that's my standard pressure. What about what's going on inside here? I've got H+, which is aqueous. H plus comes from acids. Now that 1m, if you're not familiar with that, that means 1 mole per decimeter cubed. Wait a minute. I think that was a standard concentration. Now, there's something which we can't see on here, and of course we've got to conduct this at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, I was having a discussion earlier about these standard conditions. Now, the standard conditions for solutions are very different to those of gases. Can you think why? 25 degrees is a standard for concentration, but zero degrees Celsius is a standard condition for gases. Now think about what's going to happen to a solution when I take it down to zero degrees Celsius. And if you start thinking very carefully, you might realize that solutions are full of water, and water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. And that's why we cannot use zero degrees Celsius for our standard conditions. Okay, so there we have it, a standard hydrogen electrode. We've got H2 and H+. Now, if you're taking a close and careful look at the diagram, you might notice that there's a bit of a problem with this picture. There's something at the bottom here. There's a foreign substance, and that's platinum. Now, here's the reason that we like to use platinum. Platinum has got an unusually high affinity for absorbing hydrogen. It's got one other advantage. Platinum is very inert, and it's conductive. So it allows the hydrogen as a gas to connect to a metal and then become conductive. So when we take a look down at the bottom here, I can see that the hydrogen bubbles over here, so let's just draw them in there, the hydrogen bubbles can actually stick to the platinum and become reactive. Hydrogen can't be conductive because it's a gas. So we need the platinum in there to be an electrode. So our platinum, hydrogen gas, and H plus ions, which we usually get from HCl as an acid, that makes a, start, a standard hydrogen electrode. But now, let's take a look at the rest of the picture. What's going on over here? I've got zinc, and I've got zinc 2 plus. Now what happens over here is I've got both the ion and I've got the metal. Now that means that both oxidation and reduction can take place. I could oxidize from zinc to zinc 2 plus, or I could reduce to go back. The reason that I have both is so that it can go both ways, because when we start this out, we don't actually know which way it's going to go. However, when we do connect them, we can start doing some measurements. What we find is if we connect this all, we find that zinc starts producing electrons, and these electrons move around. Those must have come from oxidation. So there we go. Oxidation has happened to the zinc. What's happening is zinc is changing into zinc 2+. And on the other side, what's going to be happening? Reduction is going to be taking place. So what we're going to find is that H plus is going to be changing into H2. And we'll find that there's bubbles given off by this reaction. OK, so very, very handy. All that I need to be able to know about the standard hydrogen electrode is those conditions, the pieces of it, and why I use it. Because it's a level playing ground. It's a standard against which we can measure other things. Now, I want you to grab that redox table. I want you to look for the value of zinc. Now, there's something on this picture that gives it away. So if I take a look at the top here, I've got a voltmeter, and that voltmeter tells me 
the potential against hydrogen when it's measured against hydrogen. Now, if we start taking a look at our table over here, I've got my two reactants. I've got zinc, I've got zinc 2 plus. Let's just circle them as we meant to. If you were watching closely last week, I showed you how to do this, but I'm going to remind you again. So here we go, we've got zinc, we had zinc 2 plus, we had hydrogen and hydrogen gas. So the hydrogen ions and hydrogen gas, zinc ions and zinc metal. We had everything and we could go both ways for both. The question is, what actually happened? Well, if you take a look on your table, you'll notice that the voltage over there is negative 0.76. That means that zinc itself really, really doesn't like undergoing reduction when it's paired up with hydrogen. Now, I think it's time for a short ad break, but what we're going to do is I want you to get this table out. After the ad break, there's going to be a really cool experiment. I'm going to show you how to figure out how to get the potential of two half cells, not just the hydrogen one. I can't wait. All right. Mindset is don't you go anywhere because as Phil said, we are doing an experiment after the break. Make sure you do stay tuned though and watch your screens very carefully because we are going to play you the After Earth trailer and I'll tell you more about it straight after the break. Welcome back, great stars, from that very short break. I hope you guys are excited about After Earth, just as I am very excited to see Will Smith and his son Jaden in action together. So all you need to do in order to enter the competition is go to learnextra.co.za forward slash After Earth and enter the following code word. Great stars, your code word for today is electrode. You drink electrodes and all of that so it's easy to remember your code word is electrode remember i do post all the stuff on facebook that you need to know all the information is there so don't be confused guys and think that i only mention it once it is on our facebook page so don't don't forget to go onto facebook.com forward slash learn extra where you get all the information you need to know about after earth if you've just tuned in you are with Looney and Phil and we're going over the SCP table and all of that our show is proudly sponsored by Macmillan so Phil let's take it away thank you so much I hope you guys enjoyed that clip I hope you're going to enjoy our experiment again today now last week we started taking a look at some of the interesting ways that you can use galvanic cells to make electricity now we're going to take it a little bit further this week now, let's just remind those that weren't watching last week what we did. We basically took two different metals. We took copper and zinc, and I've connected them up to a voltmeter over here. Now, just a little bit of elaboration from last week. I see that the black, which is meant to be negative, is connected to the zinc. I see that the red is connected to the copper as well. I want you, as the show goes on, to try and make connections and try to see why I've connected black to zinc and red to copper. Now let's turn on our voltmeter and let's see what voltage we can get out of our lemon battery. Okay, so now just a reminder as to how it works, a difference in the liking for electrons manufactures the electricity. So zinc likes to give up electrons, the copper electrode is gonna be receiving electrons. Let's see how much voltage we can get out of here. So I've turned on my voltmeter, we're gonna let it stabilize for a little bit over there. And what we're noticing is that we're getting around about 0.8 of a volt. It does change a little bit from time to time. It depends on the concentration of the electrolyte, the temperature of the lemon, but it's quite nice. We can actually start to see ah, that we've got quite a bit of voltage actually developing over there. Roughly 0.8 of a volt, it does change from time to time. And it also changes as the reaction goes on. If I left this for a very long time, this voltage would eventually drop to zero as the chemicals ran out and the zinc was oxidized. Now, you can even pull out these electrodes and you can actually see that they're chemically changed. So I'm going to ask you to come a little bit closer and actually take a look at what's happened to these electrodes as it's come out. You'll notice that the copper, as I've taken it out, is incredibly clean. Now, you'll notice that the copper hasn't been eaten away at all. But if we notice on the zinc, we can start to see that the zinc has actually started to corrode. We can see that there's this black coating and we can actually see that there's tiny little pieces which have started coming off the zinc. There's strong corrosion over here, showing us that oxidation has taken place at the zinc. There's no oxidation on the copper. In fact, it's really nice and shiny, and all of the additional stuff has been oxidized off the copper, but reduction actually takes place at this one, and oxidation at this one. There's our proof. Oxidation has taken place at our zinc, and we can see it. Now, 
Just going back to last week, there was a different way to do this, and this was a more structured, organized way of arranging our two metals. Here are two half cells. We've separated these. Now, I just want to get rid of some misconceptions that people have got about these cells. Now, these two half pieces are called half cells. I've got my copper half cell and my zinc half cell. Now, the collection of the electrolyte and this metal piece, very often that collection is actually called the electrode. So this would be called my copper electrode, the electrolyte and the copper itself, the zinc and the zinc itself. Now, we've taken a look at what happens when we put these two metals inside an as acid electrolyte like a lemon. But now what happens when we put them into a proper cell like this with the salt bridge in between them? So you can see my zinc and my copper are sticking into the solution. Once again, I'm going to plug black onto zinc, and I want you to think about why. And then copper gets the red one for positive. And what we can see is that there's actually significantly more voltage when I connect them in this way. I want you to think about why there might be more voltage in this way. Start thinking about reasons that the EMF might have changed, or at least the voltage of the cells might have changed. And if you're watching carefully from last week, concentration might be a factor, but I don't think that's the case. It might actually be to do with the type of chemistry that's taking place. Now, something which I particularly like to try is to try use different electrolytes and different combinations of metals. So let's see if it's just the electrolytes. What I've got over here is a potato. Now, the potato has also got some electrolytes inside it. I've got my copper and my zinc inside it. Let's see if it's the electrolyte that's producing all of this different voltage. Now, remember that our lemon produced around about 0.8 volts. Now, taking a look at my potato, my potato with the same connections is also only producing around about 0.8 volts, nowhere near the same amount as these other ones. So it must be to do with the cell chemistry. Potatoes and lemons seem to be performing exactly the same. Now, if you want a little bit of an explanation, they both have some acids inside. Lemons have got citric and ascorbic acid inside them, and potatoes have got some phosphoric acid inside them. So both of them have acid electrolytes. There's no acid in these two. So it's something to do with the type of chemistry which decides the voltage. Now, before the show, I was playing around a little bit, and I wanted to kid around and see if I could swap out some of the metals and see if I still get a voltage. Now, something particularly interesting to try out is some metal items. I've got here some soldering wire, some soldering wire which is made up of mostly lead and tin, and I'm going to stick that into my zinc solution. We'll find out why soon. Or I could use my screwdriver. Now, we can use either of these materials to manufacture electricity. So let's just collect our voltmeter. Let's simplify the picture a little bit. Now, keep your eyes on the voltmeter. What we're going to do now is we're now still going to connect our red to copper, and we connect connect our negative black electrode, first of all, to the screwdriver. Now, what we notice is something quite different. When I use a screwdriver, which is filled up with iron and chrome, what we'll find is that the voltage, when I use iron and copper, the voltage is lower. That's very interesting. What about some lead? Let's use some lead and tin. So we're going to change the metal again. So if I use lead and tin, take a look at the voltage which is produced. The voltage is very low. So what I can deduce from all of these experiments is that the half cells are what produce that electricity. The difference in the actual reactions taking place inside these are responsible for the EMF, or at least the voltage or potential produced by the whole cell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you back to Looney, and what's happening on that page? While Pinduloshan is asking, what is the solution that a salt bridge is made up of? Okay, really, really nice question. Okay, now a salt bridge, the function of a salt bridge, first of all, is to be a salt. Mm. Now that salt is made up of positive and negative ions. Now that's its function, is to produce those ions or at least have those ions available to move into those two half reactions where they're needed. Now the salt bridge itself doesn't actually participate in the reaction, but supplies ions, because that's what salts are made of. Mm -hmm. Really nice question. Keep asking those questions. Okay. So now let's get down into the chemistry. Let's try and see if we can predict what's going on inside our zinc and copper cell. So now, remember I told you that this galvanic cell with the zinc and the copper, how do we predict, first of all, that these two reactions take place? And how do we figure out that roughly one volt is made out of these two? Now, the trick is to look at your redox table, to look at that standard reduction potential table. Now, 
a lot of the metrics are saying, well, Phil, how did you magically come up with these two half reactions as they are? I'm going to explain to you how to do it from that half reaction. So now, taking a look at our standard potential table over here, my standard reduction potential, there's some interesting things on the side here which I can see. So now let me just grab my pen and draw them on. Okay, so here we go. You'll notice that on the left-hand side of my table, I've got an arrow pointing down, and on the right-hand side, the arrow points up. That tells you the strongest reactant. So your first step on this is basically to put yourself in a position where you've got all the possibilities in front of you. That means to circle all my possible reactants. Please don't put, in, put yourself into that bad habit of circling a whole reaction. That's going to disadvantage you. So circle just your reactant. Here's what I mean. I had zinc 2 plus ions. I had some zinc metal. I also had the copper ions, the copper 2 plus ions. Now watch out, there's several copper 2 pluses. Circle them both because they're both potentially a reactant. I've also got copper metal over here. All right, well, this is interesting. I've got a contest between three things on the left-hand side and between two things on the right-hand side. How do I choose the best one? Now, my table is very useful because the arrow actually tells me which one to choose. On the left-hand side, between all three of these, which one should I choose? Well, the one which wins this is copper 2+. plus. So copper 2 plus is a reactant. Now what that word actually means is I start my reaction with copper 2 plus. So one of my reactions starts with copper 2 plus. But now let's look at the right hand side. Where's the competition between zinc on the top and copper on the bottom? Which one's going to win? Again, I look at my arrow. My arrow points upwards. That means that zinc is my other reactant. So here's how you write out your proper redox half reactions, my proper reduction and oxidation reactions. Copper 2 plus goes across. So you start from your reactant and you write across to the other side. So I started with copper 2 plus, I moved across to the other side. Now the next one's a little bit trickier. What about zinc? I start at zinc and then I write out starting from zinc going across to the other side. So let's take a look at our reactions. So up at the top, I've written out those reactions as I've told you. I started with zinc and I started with copper 2 plus. Those were the ones which won the contest. Those were the best reactants. Now what happened to zinc was zinc went to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons. That's the loss of electrons and that is oxidation. Copper 2 plus added 2 electrons to itself. It gained electrons and that is reduction. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to write down the voltages which are next to these two reactions. So let's see what they are. If you go to the redox table, you'll see that there's some numbers written next to them. Next to zinc, I see negative 0.76. Next to copper, positive 0.34. I want you to write both of those down. So here's a good way to do it. So zinc, remember, had a negative value of 0.76. Copper had a value of positive 0.34. The question is, how do I put these together? Well, that's down to the equation. Now, here's your equation for figuring out how much voltage I can predict out of a cell. So very often this is called E0 cell, but that's not really a naught up there. That just means under standard conditions for a cell is equal to the electrode potential at the cathode minus electrode potential at the anode. Now you might say, Phil, well, why did you go through all this mission, all this effort, if they're talking about cathodes and anodes? I need to figure out which one is the cathode and which one is the anode. So over here, the cathode is where reduction takes place. Now there's a trick to this. Reduction takes place at the cathode red cat. That's very often a way to remember which one is the cathode. Reduction takes place at the cathode, so therefore anode is where oxidation takes place. Please, these are not plus and minus terms. Okay, Anode is where oxidation takes place. doesn't matter what type of cell you got. Okay, so now I'm going to show you another trick which might help you, which might save your life. Substitute using brackets, please, because some of these values are negative and that can change things a bit. So my cathode is where reduction takes place. So that's 
positive 0.34. I subtract from that a negative voltage, and this is why the brackets help so much, 0.76. And wait a minute, something comes out the other side which I particularly like, and that's 1,1 volts. That's not too dissimilar from what we actually saw in the experiment. Around about one volt was the voltage produced by a combination of copper and zinc. We've actually predicted, using our table, how much voltage we could predict would come out of a battery or a voltaic or a uh, galvanic cell made up of zinc and copper. Now, I want you to do the same thing when I start to take a look at these two, iron and copper. I want you to try and figure out why the combination of iron and copper, in other words, the screwdriver and copper, produced a much smaller voltage. So just running through the process again, I've written them down in the correct way. Now we're going to use the voltage and we're going to predict another voltage, and we're going to show that it's a slightly lower value, and just make sure that everyone's on board. So let's start that process again. Now, another hint for when you're studying. Guys, your... your tables are going to get very, very dirty and very, very scratched and full of pencil and whatnot. One of the things that I advise that you do is actually print one of these out, a nice, clean, pristine copy, and you go down to PostNet and you say to them, here's my five rand, please laminate this for me. If you laminate one of these, you can use it again and again and again and again. And you just need to have a highlighter or a cokey and you can just wash it off. And that's fantastic. It's a really nice way to study on this table. Okay, so now what did I say to you? Let's try and figure out why iron produced less voltage. So here we go. Let's circle our potential reactants. Well, if I start looking around on my table here, wait a minute, there's iron and Fe2+. If you start taking a look around, there's also iron, but we didn't have Fe3+. I told you we had Fe2+. There's our copper 2+. Now this is looking very complicated. We've got three on each side. Doesn't matter. Follow the arrows. Now, all that I needed to do was to figure out the best one on the left was to go down to the bottom. Copper 2 plus, once again, is my reactant. But now on the right-hand side, what I notice is that iron is my reactant. So I start out with iron and I move across. And that would be oxidation because there's a loss of electrons. Copper gains electrons to undergo reduction. Okay, well, that's quite interesting. But now let's look at the voltages. Iron has a reduction potential of negative 0.44, while copper still has its reduction potential of positive 0.34. That means copper really does like undergoing reduction. So let's see what that means for our voltage. So our iron potential over there, let's write it in as we go. So iron underwent oxidation, and that had a negative... 0.44 voltage and take a look on this other side we've got copper at 0.34 if I combine these two using the same reaction or at least using the same equation what I'll find is that this is actually going to produce a significantly smaller voltage so let's go for it let's actually find out what E naught cell or E standard cell is equal to the potential at the cathode Subtract from that the potential at the anode, which is equal to. Now, I want you to guide me through this. What is the potential at the cathode? Well, first of all, which one is the cathode? Hmm. The cathode is the place where reduction takes place. So here we go. This is my cathode potential. Where oxidation takes place, this is my anode. So let's actually write it out in full. If you're making some notes, let's just make sure that they're comprehensive and full. Okay, so there we go. We've got our cathode, we've got our anode. Let's put in the values. So positive 0.34. And once again, please, the trick is to substitute using brackets. Guys, this will help you everywhere in your science. Use the brackets. I still use the brackets, and my matrix get very tired of me telling, me telling them about the brackets. But they really are helpful. What we'll find out of this one is a significantly lower voltage. So what we'll find out of this is 0.78 volts. Hmm, That's much less than 1.1 volts. And that's exactly what we found in our experiment. Iron will produce less voltage when combined with copper than zinc. So a zinc-copper battery is a much better battery than an iron-copper battery. 
That's pretty fascinating. But now, what about the fact that these are positive? What does it mean? Well, the fact that these are positive means that these reactions are spontaneous and they can give off energy. Guys, I think we're going to take another short ad break. I know this has been a lot of fun, but we've got to give you some rest. All right. Guys, we are going to take another short break, but after the break, I'll tell you about after the After Earth special that we have on tomorrow's show. So make sure you do stay tuned. Welcome back, Mindsetters. I hope you guys are ready to start again. Just to tell you about the After Earth special that will be happening tomorrow, it is from 7 to half past 7. So the, li the life sciences lesson will carry on. It won't end at 7 and it will co continue until half past 7. Basically what's happening is that we're showing you how life sciences and After Earth are linked together with the lesson plans that will be happening on that show. So all you need to do is go into lifeafterearthscience.com in order to get all that information, all the lesson plans are there for you guys to see what will be happening tomorrow. Evolution will be discussed tomorrow and Macmillan will be streaming in live for their, uh, for their digital launch. So I hope you guys do watch it. It's not for grade 12s only, it's for all grades guys. So make sure you tune in for the After Earth special. Phil, we have a few questions here. Awesome. So, let's just check. Oh, why did I leave this now? Okay, yeah. Stembi so is asking, can I ask, do we use the same formula for the cathode and the anode? I often confuse it with the reduction and the oxidation and ah. think they are both different. Okay, indeed. Very, very good question. It's quite confusing. There's all these new words and it's really easy to mix up. Now, I want to try to simplify things a little bit. Now, I want to get away from all the chemistry and I just want to start thinking in terms of simple concepts. Now, the question is, what is oxidation and what is reduction? Now, a lot of people say, okay, you know what, but the energy levels and the electrons. Guys, let's strip it down to the real basics and let's take a look at where the electrons are. So first of all, if I start out with something and I start out with something and it becomes positive and the electrons come out on the right-hand side, that means that electrons are a product. What I've written out here is a very simple scheme for something which is undergoing oxidation. Now, oxidation is the loss of electrons. How can I see that electrons are being lost? Now, here's the confusing thing. People see this plus over here and they go crazy. They say, uh, 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 uh. Plus means add. No. When you're looking in chemical formulas, plus means and. So I'm saying that I'm going from something, my reactant, and I'm producing an ion, and I'm also producing electrons. That means that electrons are coming out. So this is what goes in, and this is what comes out. Electrons are coming out of my reaction. That means that oxidation is taking place. Now, Stembiso's question was, how do I know about anode and cathode? Now, this reaction is oxidation, which means that it's taking place at the anode. So to answer your question, you've got to decide if your reaction is oxidation or reduction. Now, let's just be thorough about this. Let's write it the other way around. What happens if you've got a particular reaction over here that says, I went something plus electrons went to go make some sort of iron. It might be a negative iron. It doesn't actually matter what it is. What I care about is where is the electron or where are the electrons? The electrons are going in. That means that something is gaining electrons. So if electrons are going into my reaction, so they're going in on the left-hand side, that means that this process is reduction. So reduction is taking place. Now, reduction always, 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 always takes place at the cathode. It's nothing to do with plus and minus. Please don't get that into your heads. Cathode and anode, the names originally do come from plus and minus, but guys, they are reduction and oxidation terms. Oxidation at the anode, reduction at the cathode. I hope that answers the question. Let's take one short one before we get into the exam style question. Okay. How, how do we find, Mtokozis is asking, how do you find the half reaction of the galvanic cell? Ah, okay. Now, what they're talking about, Tokozo was saying, how do I find out which reaction is taking place? Now, what I've got to do is I've got to go back to this table. You've got to do exactly what I did. The first step is to find out what we have. So let me just go through those steps again. So I've got this table over here. 
I'm not sure what my reactions are or how to write them. So the first thing I want you to do is to grab your pencil or your highlighter or this really nice laminated redox table over here. And I want you actually to go with your pencil and circle your reactants. Now what I mean by that is you've got to circle all the chemicals that you've got. I had, for instance, in the first one, I had zinc 2 plus ions. I had zinc metal. I had copper 2 plus, but I found copper 2 plus twice, so I've got to circle it twice. I also had copper. Now if you're at this stage, you've actually done the hard work. Here's how you figure out your reactions. Once again, you've got to choose one on the left and you've got to choose one on the right. So on the left, I've got zinc 2 plus, I've got copper 2 plus and copper 2 plus. Which one is going to win the race? Now look at my arrow over here. The arrow tells me to look at the bottom for the best one. Copper 2 plus. On the right hand side, which one's going to win? Copper or zinc? Once again, I look at my arrow. My arrow tells me which one to choose. So out of copper and zinc, that tells me to choose zinc. So now those two ones that I chose, copper 2 plus and zinc, that's where I'm going to start my reactions. So just doing it quickly with you. So for the zinc, let's write this in a nice bright color. So I start with zinc. So it goes zinc, then an arrow. It's one, one direction. goes to zinc 2 plus, plus two electrons. What about the copper 2 plus? Well, I start with the one which I chose. So it's copper 2 plus, plus two electrons, goes to copper metal. I hope that answers that question. Okay, well, guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump online and I'm going to answer some of your questions. And uh, I, I think that's the way to do it because I really want to get into this past paper question and show you how it's asked in exams. So let's do exactly that. So here we go. This is adapted from the March 2010 paper. Okay, guys, and it starts talking to you about galvanic cells. So this is great practice. It tells me that batteries consist of one or more galvanic cells. A galvanic cell is a combination of two half cells. John wants to decide which one of option A, so option A is over here, so there's option A, or option B, let's make option B a different color, so option B, shown below, can be used to construct the cell with the highest potential difference. Okay, now let's see what's going on inside this question. It tells me that we've got two combinations of cells. Highest potential difference. Guys, this is just fancy language for saying they want the highest E naught cell. So we're going to have to do a little bit of calculation. They want the highest E naught cell. And we can figure that out using our equation, using our knowledge of redox. But now they tell me in the first one to draw a fully labeled diagram of the galvanic cell that John can use to measure the potential difference for the cell in option B. Use a positive and negative sign to indicate the positive and negative electrodes, respectively. Now, guys, remember I told you to start thinking about pluses and minuses. Now, this is where it's going to start working for you. So they tell me that I must draw out option B. So now in option B, I've got to have magnesium with some magnesium nitrate. I've got to have silver and silver nitrate. Now, those have all got to be inside some half cells. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to make two half cells. Now let's take away all the dots. Let's uh, get a nice clean page and then let's start constructing what we've got. So let's make our two half cells. So now inside the one half cell, let's actually make them normally. Let's draw them manually. So there we go. We've got one half cell, another half cell. Okay, now guys, if you remember from earlier on in the show, what I had to have connecting these two half cells was a YouTube which was filled up with the salt. And I called that a salt bridge. Now that's not a very nicely drawn salt bridge, so let's just neaten it up a little bit. Guys, I'm sure that you're far more artistic than I am. You can see why I'm a science teacher. And that had cotton wool plugs down at the bottom, and I filled that up with a solution of KNO3. Now that's just a little bit of detail. I don't know if they're looking for that, but it's better safe than sorry. So potassium nitrate is a very nice salt to use. Now, in the left, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my piece of metal, and that's going to be my magnesium solid. Into the solution, I'm going to have magnesium nitrate. But now, guys, remember when you put a salt in a solution, a salt is made up of positive ions and negative ions, and they're going to split apart from each other. So magnesium is going to make positive two ions, and we've got those nitrate ions. 
inside there. Now, what happens on the other side? Well, we got told that there was also another metal, which was Ag. And we also had to have the salt, which was AgNO3. So ions need to be inside that solution. So let's fill up our solution. Let's make sure that we've got a nice level of liquid inside there. But we're still missing something. We cannot actually measure the voltage of this. Now, you saw me use a voltmeter. So I've got to connect a voltmeter between these two electrodes. So there we go. A voltmeter is connected between these two. So there is the full apparatus, but now we haven't answered the question yet. Do I have magnesium as positive or negative, or do I use my silver as positive or negative? How on earth can I tell? Now, if you've grabbed your redox table, and I hope that you have, I want you to see that their position actually gives it away. So magnesium, magnesium 2 plus, I'm actually just drawing their relative positions on your table, and what you can see is Ag plus, and AG over there. Now, if this was your table, and you had the arrow pointing down on the left and the arrow pointing up on the right, I want you to do the help for me. I want you to choose which one's going to undergo reduction and which one's going to undergo oxidation. So now, out of magnesium 2 plus and AG plus, which one is the better reactant? I choose AG plus. Why? Because there's an arrow telling me that that is the best reactant. On the right-hand side, between Ag metal and magnesium metal, which one is going to react? The top one. The top one is going to react. So now, how do these reactions actually happen? Well, I start from the ones which I've got my magnesium. I go across. Magnesium goes to magnesium 2 plus and gives away two electrons. Ag plus takes an electron and becomes the metal. So magnesium undergoes oxidation, while silver undergoes reduction. Now, how do I decide which one is positive and which one is negative? Well, in a galvanic cell, where oxidation takes place, I make a whole bunch of electrons. I manufacture them. They come out of the oxidation because remember that oxidation is the giving away of electrons. So magnesium is giving away electrons, and the only place that they can go is through the outside circuit. That means that magnesium is the negative electrode. The reason that they're flowing in the outside circuit is because they're going to silver, which is positive. It needs the electrons for its reaction. It needs the electrons to do reduction of the silver ions. So these positive ions are pulling the electrons around the outside circuit to get them, to grab them, to undergo reduction. So there's the first part of our question. So let's start taking a look at some of the voltages now. Now John's decided that he wants to figure out which one is going to be doing this. So we've got to write down balanced chemical equation excluding spectator ions for the net overall cell reaction for the galvanic cell in option B. Now guys, I'm actually going to slow it down a little bit. I want you to work ahead of me. I want you to see how to go through this because, guys, science is not something that you can just watch. I know it's fun to watch us. We've got all these experiments on TV, but science is doing, guys. Guys is putting pen to paper to try and figure this out, actually grabbing one of these tables and starting to scribble on them, laminate it like this and start highlighting it. Now what I want you to do is to go onto this table, and we've got links to these tables. They're inside your papers. They're inside your textbook. Grab this table. Grab a pencil. Now, I want you to find the following things. So I'm going to give you a shopping list. So John decides that he wants to go with option B for the moment. So here it is. Here's your shopping list. I've already mentioned it before. But there we go. I want you to find magnesium. Look on your table. Where do you find magnesium? Not magnesium 2+, plus, but magnesium itself. Now, MgNO3-2, magnesium nitrate you're not going to find this thing on your table. You will not find this because this doesn't exist when they become in solution or they dis uh, dissolve. What happens is that magnesium itself is an ion in solution, Mg2+. So there's a second item on your shopping list. The third item on your shopping list is going to be a bit confusing. 
and O3 minus. Then I want you to look again for the metal AG. So the shopping list is getting full. Then AG plus, because that's the silver ion when it's dissolved. And again, you've got nitrate, so we can't look for it twice. Now you're gonna have a whole bunch of circles on your table. So you're gonna have circles all over the place. Now, step two. Step two is to select which, which one. Can you remember which way we do this? The hint, look at the arrows. Which one is going to be my reactant? Well, if you followed my steps and if you followed my instructions, here's what you're gonna land up with. You're going to tell me that MG is one of my reactants. You're going to tell me that magnesium is one of my reactants. If you followed that step as well, you're going to find that Ag plus is the other reactant. So it's Ag plus plus electron. That's my other reactant. Those are the two best ones. Now, how do I complete all of this? So now, if I read it from magnesium across to the other side, I'll see that magnesium goes to make Mg2 plus plus two electrons. What about silver? Silver plus electron equals silver metal. Now that's not all. We've got our two half reactions. And just for practice, let's label them as oxidation and reduction. So here we go. Magnesium goes to magnesium two plus plus two electrons. The electrons are coming out. Something lost them. Something gave them away. This is oxidation. And coincidentally, this is the anode. If you asked a little bit later on which one's the anode or the cathode, this is how you tell. If the electrons come out, this is oxidation and this is the anode. So magnesium is the anode. What about silver? Silver undergoes reduction because the electrons went in. So reduction, where does that take place? Well, guys, if you've been listening very carefully, I've said it a number of times, but here it is. Reduction takes place at the cathode. Cool. Now we're ready to answer the rest of the question. It wants a balanced chemical equation. These are two half reactions. How do I make them into a whole reaction? Well, now what I've got to do is I've got to realize that there's an exchange of electrons. Balance them. Here's your problem. At the moment, I've got two electrons coming out of my magnesium, but only one going into my silver. So what I've got to do is I've got to balance them by multiplying my Ag by two to make sure that I've got two electrons out and two electrons in. So that tells me that they're now balanced. Now to finish this off, what you can do is just add everything on the left hand side. So two Ag plus magnesium, doesn't matter which way around, Magnesium 2 plus is a product, plus 2 Ag. Now here's a bit of a challenge for you guys. I want you to find out what the cell potential is, so what the E0 cell is of this. All right, so let's just make sure that we've got all of this. Okay, there we go. Take a look at my balanced chemical equation. What we've got to do is calculate the E0 cell, but guys, I'm going to leave that up to you and answer some of your questions on Facebook. That's it from me. Okay, cool. Can I just quickly congratulate Prudence Nemungumoni for winning two tickets to go watch After Earth. Congratulations to you. Your tickets will be coming to you very soon. Someone asked, how do you write the cell notation of a cell? I'm afraid I'm going to have to do that on Facebook. I'm not okay. sure that we've actually got time to answer okay, that, cool. but very Mindset, good question. Okay. Mindset is make sure that you watch Half Past 10 Physical Sciences this weekend. See you then, guys. Bye.